Uh, this is a fun talk assignment uh, for me. Thank you, Tim, for that, um, presenting uh, uh, complex cases in labor repair and reconstruction. So you'll see some, um, some new and different in this talk. Uh, but uh, to review briefly what's been so well presented uh, already, um, in treating a labor tear, I think the overriding goal is reproduce the anatomy and function. So no matter what the technique, repair, reconstruction, different anchors, uh, different suture configurations, that, that goal has really remained consistent over the years. And these are the functions of the labrum as we understand it, uh, which amalgamate into a chondroprotective role. Uh, so uh, the uh, guiding principle, I think, uh, has been one of Gonza's early statements that the labrum sealing mechanisms are dependent on the fit of the labrum against the femoral head. And that principle has sort of guided uh, the development of labral base refixation and uh, controlled tension anatomic uh, repair and the labral reconstruction techniques uh, that I'll show. Uh, so really this started with the recognition that sometimes uh, repairs were problematic and uh, they may uh, have an everted or bunched labrum uh, or for various reasons uh, the, they may not uh, accomplish a restoration of the contact with the femoral head and the restoration of the suction seal. So as we developed uh, the various permutations of labral base refixation, again, the goal remained consistent to preserve this triangular cross-sectional shape with uh, uh, contact against the femoral head that restored uh, the seal. And then as this evolved a little further, uh, we evolved uh, to do the labral refixation without labral detachment. Um, earlier on, we were detaching the labrum. Uh, in every case, uh, going back 10 years or so, and then uh, started to realize we could accomplish acetabuloplasties without uh, disrupting the chondrolabral junction and then subsequently uh, repair uh, the labrum. So uh, here's a video of a labral base refixation uh, technique from our original article uh, going back to uh, 2010. Um, uh, so the, the base of the labrum is captured and this leaves the edge of the labrum uh, free to create contact against the femoral head so that when we take uh, the uh, traction off, you'll see good contact throughout uh, along that seal. So that's kind of our shot shown there. Uh, the next iteration was the controlled tension anatomic uh, technique, same goals, re restore the contact of the labrum uh, against the femoral head, but um, I think this became applicable early on in uh, some of the labra that might not support two passes uh, through their substance um, uh, because of the quality or size of the tissue. Uh, but same goal, achieve consistent seal of the labrum against the femoral head, and now uh, this became possible with uh, inserter out selective tensioning of the repair sutures uh, using the knotless suture tack technology. Uh, so uh, I'll show that here. Um, you have a, a little animation running in the bottom right of how the um, anchor works. And then in the video here in the center, uh, you see the, uh, the actual technique. So we impact the, the anchor. Uh, we pass the uh, repair suture, typically with the labral scorpion here. Um, and I've got inside and outside views. And then retrieve the um, looped end of the shuttle suture through the same cannula. Uh, and pull the other end out through the other cannula. So we've got two working portals there, which I find uh, really helpful. Uh, you can also use percutaneous portals like I'm doing uh, in this anchor uh, and uh, use the percutaneous kit to place uh, anchors without having to uh, create another full portal. Uh, so uh, I think that's, that's a helpful uh, pearl as well because like John talked about, uh, there are a lot of different angles that can be advantageous depending where you are around the rim. Uh, and you want to use all the advantages uh, that you can get. Um, so that's the control tension anatomic uh, repair technique. Now the labral reconstruction uh, technique, this has been uh, a long evolution uh, for me and it's uh, progressed uh, in terms of its indications uh, and uh, its technique. Um, indications for me currently are segmental uh, loss of the labrum, a calcified labrum, or in the revision setting, a failed previous debridement or uh, failed previous repair. Uh, tend to be uh, the indications. Uh, so you saw here uh, an irreparable uh, labrum and we've placed all our, uh, all our sutures. I'll go through the technique in a little more detail uh, later on in the talk. Uh, but uh, we did uh, look at this study showing that labral reconstruction was superior to segmental resection uh, for the irreparable tear. So I think we've uh, in large part answered that question uh, and seen that 
Uh, if we can't repair the labrum, we're probably better off uh, reconstructing it than leaving a patient without a functional uh, labrum. So the evidence then for reconstruction uh, in cases of an irreparable or an absent labrum in my mind starts with the biomechanical evidence, uh, which we've seen. The labral, uh, labrum is critical to the function of the hip. Uh, now level two clinical evidence with that comparative study showing that uh, the labral reconstruction is superior to um, uh, labral resection. And then of course, common sense, which is always one of our greatest guiding principles in orthopedics for better or for worse. Uh, and the, the hip was made with a labrum, I think for a reason, and uh, we probably ought to uh, leave a patient's hip uh, with a functional labrum if we can. So I'll get on to a couple complex or difficult cases. Uh, here's a 45-year-old female with left hip pain uh, who had had some uh, previous chiropractic care. She sometimes required a crutch uh, to ambulate, and uh, she had ongoing left uh, hip pain uh, aggravated with activity and flexion. Uh, uh, the provocative tests weren't uh, particularly uh, exceptional, uh, but um, diagnostic injection did confirm <coughs> her intraarticular source of pain. And here when we get to the radiographs, she's got an MRI uh, that shows a labral tear. I won't belabor that, but um, she's got dysplasia, uh, or at least um, uh, mild dysplasia. Lateral center edge angle is 17 degrees. Um, so anytime we have dysplasia, we think about a PAO. Um, but she's 45 uh, and uh, not particularly excited about a PAO. And I think as you uh, age a little more, the, the risk reward starts to tilt a little bit away from uh, PAOs. So she wasn't uh, particularly excited about that option, but she did want to have something done. Um, she felt she could not uh, live with it uh, as is. So we get in arthroscopically, and uh, she's got this rather complex uh, combined Celdes 1 and 2 tear, and she's got a, a chondral flap, an ALAD 3. Um, and so here's what we do. Uh, we did a, a labral repair. Uh, the acetabuloplasty was really just a, a decortication to create bleeding. Uh, did a femoroplasty. Uh, did a capsular plication and then did a shelf procedure overlying the capsule. So this is an extra capsular shelf, um, which uh, uh, Soshi Uchida uh, really uh, got started in Japan, and uh, he and I have uh, frequently compared notes as we've gone on. And uh, she's had a very successful outcome uh, after this, now at uh, one year follow-up. Um, so uh, very happy uh, with that outcome. Clearly a complex case, and uh, I think the um, indications for this procedure are still very much in evolution, but uh, complex cases were my assignment here, so wouldn't behoove me to put up the, straight, uh, the straightforward ones. So here's another one. This is a 28-year-old NFL player uh, who had had a previous left hip arthroscopy. Um, he had a retear of the uh, labrum and had some residual cam. Uh, so on him, we did a, a labral reconstruction uh, with the knotless pull-through technique. Uh, and this technique has really made this so much easier for me. Um, we place all the uh, anchors prior to the um, insertion of the graft, usually an average about 10 to 12 anchors. We pull the graft uh, through the joint from the anterior portal out the posterior lateral portal, and then we fixate with the pre-placed anchors working from anterior to posterior. So the actual reconstruction portion of this surgery can be accomplished in about 20 minutes. Uh, and we have not yet sized the graft. We haven't amputated it until the end. Uh, so we amputate the excess graft after we have uh, completed the reconstruction. And then when we take the uh, traction off, we see the seal against the femoral head. So uh, here's a, a last case, 47-year-old uh, uh, female with a work-related uh, injury and sea sign pain, um, has groin pain, has pain with essentially all motions of the hip and, uh, and all impingement tests. Uh, so here are her x-rays, and um, we see maybe a little hint of early arthritis uh, here, certainly some overcoverage and uh, some calcification of uh, the acetabular rim. Uh, so. Uh, when we get, uh, get her prepared for uh, surgery, we want a degemeric MRI because I want to uh, suss out how much arthritis she may or may not have. So her degemeric in index is uh, 410, so we're pretty uh, satisfied that the cartilage uh, has good quality and we don't see any overt uh, arthritic signs on the degemeric MRI such as uh, subchondral cysts or sclerosis. Um, so after she fails uh, physical therapy, we discuss all her options and uh, decide on a hip arthroscopy, and this is what we encounter. So this is a very shredded labrum. This is in a primary surgery setting, but I don't feel I can repair this labrum well uh, and uh, come out with 
something good. Um, so uh, we pursue a labor reconstruction here in the primary setting, uh, and uh, I believe she had a 12 anchor circumferential uh, reconstruction. So we're going all the way from the TAL antero inferiorly all the way down to posterior inferiorly to the uh, TAL attachment on the other side, trying not to uh, disrupt the attachment of the TAL itself, and then complete her reconstruction here, circumferential reconstruction. Uh, and um, again, there are a lot of technical aspects to this, but I think once you uh, have the technique perfected, uh, this can be a very, very reproducible and consistent uh, surgery to do. Um, so I'm running short of time here, but um, here's kind of my algorithm for how I'd approach uh, this stuff. If uh, we can't uh, uh, repair the labrum because it's not viable, I'll uh, usually consider a reconstruction. If I can preserve the labrum, uh, if I'm doing a minimal rim trimming and, uh, and the labrum's stable, I might not even need a repair, but in most cases the labrum's destabilized and I do need a repair. So in uh, that scenario, I try to do the repair without a detachment. Uh, in uh, a very large rim trimming, you may have to do a labral takedown and, and repair. Um, so to sum it up, we've gone through a few techniques in some complex uh, cases, but we've talked through the labral base refixation technique, the controlled tension anatomic repair technique, the labral reconstruction using the knotless pull-through technique. I think we've established that the labral function depends on the seal against the uh, femur, and that anatomic repair or reconstruction may allow us uh, to preserve the labral function. Thanks very much. <laughs>